from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A tribute carved with care. And we're paying tribute to four inventors who have called Ohio home. A look at what went into creating this year's butter sculpture at the Ohio State Fair. Sweltering heat. It was not unusual to see 95, 94, and 99 degrees at Senna here in Yuma. How farmers in Arizona are surviving days of triple digit temperatures, plus a week of big soybean buys. China's back in the game, that Brazil's price is high. But why now? And what do the sales say about the current crop in the ground? Right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. U.S. soybeans seem to be a popular buy lately for our trading partners. USDA announcing several flash sales recently. Now take a look. It started on Monday with China buying 121,000 metric tons. That was followed on Wednesday by two buys to unknown destinations totaling more than 500,000 metric tons. Thursday, another sale to unknown destinations of 256 thousand metric tons and then several buys on Friday again for unknown destinations China and Mexico totaling more than 909,000 metric tons adding it up that's over 1.78 million metric tons or more than 65.6 million bushels in just one week. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us and Michelle what's behind this sudden interest in U.S. soybeans? Clinton, some of the market experts I talked to think it's tied to the fact that China and the rest of the world is becoming concerned about the size of the U.S. crop as we go into that critical August reproductive time stage for soybeans. It may also be a bit of a currency play. However, U.S. soybean exports are woefully behind normal for this time of year, so that may be why we didn't get a more bullish price reaction. Global buyers are closely watching U.S. soybean crop development. The balance sheet is tight with only 83 and a half million acres. Plus, only 54% of the crop is rated good to excellent, and the U.S. drought monitor shows 53% of beans under some level of drought, nearly double of last year. I think that's the next step in this puzzle because we are getting closer to the end of the month. I would, I would think that the trade would start thinking about the next WASD report. The Chinese probably already are. U.S. new crop soybeans have also become more price competitive recently for global buyers. These unknown sales are, I think, being expected to be from China. That suggests that China's back in the game, that Brazil's price is high. Brazil's price is high in part because the dollar is at a 13-month low against the Brazilian real. This week's sales bring year-to-date new crop soybean export bookings up to 7.2 million tons, but this is down 35 percent from the five-year average. And China has only booked a little more than 3 million metric tons of U.S. beans. Keep in mind, last year was 8 at this time. Uh, the year before was 4.4 at this time. So I still have concerns that while we are getting sales, they're probably not at the level we need to be uh, at here. So we do suggest that maybe in two or three months, USDA will be taking a, a more serious discussion on the export sales issue. Nelson says USDA's current new crop goal is just 8% lower than average, so he expects the agency will need to lower exports by 100 to 200 million bushels sometime this fall. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. More signs that inflation pressures are cooling in the U.S. A new report says consumer prices last month rose at their slowest pace in more than two years. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, which is closely watched by the Federal Reserve, rose 3% from a year earlier. The so-called core PCE rate rising 4.1% from a year ago. The increase is still above the Fed's 2% inflation target. Experts say the slowdown reflects lower gas prices and smaller increases in costs at the grocery store. Rising prices but also rising temperatures have been an issue across much of the country. The UN Secretary General says scientists confirmed July was on track to be the world's hottest month on record. Here in the U.S., analysts expect crop condition ratings to take a hit from all of this heat, while Arizona, it seems to be taking the brunt of it. Now, how's it impacting farmers there? That's exactly what Farm Journal's Tyne Morgan wanted to find out. Heat making headlines all across the country last week. Arizona seeming to be in the bullseye of it with a record streak of days 110 degrees or greater. But Yuma County, Arizona farmer John Bolt says the heat isn't really that abnormal for them. 
the heat always impacts us, but I think the best way to describe it is we're used to that. Um, that's normal weather for July in the low desert here, uh, like here in Yuma or in, or in central Arizona. But we're kind of used to the warm weather. The streak of heat in Arizona isn't the only news generator this week. It's also the all-time record low temperature. As a teenager starting to work in ag full-time myself, I can remember leaving to go to work and passing the bank signs long before we all had thermometers in our vehicles and whatnot. And it was not unusual to see 95, 94, or 99 degrees at sunup here in Yuma on the bank signs as you're driving through town headed out to the field. So uh, that's kind of what we're experiencing now. Yuma County, Arizona farmer John Boltz says his area is known for growing crops like leafy greens, broccoli, and cauliflower that's then shipped across the U.S. and Canada. But it's those crops you won't see growing here in the heat of the summer. Uh, this time of year, we know it's going to be hot, so we're growing crops like cotton. Uh, we have Sudan grass. He says farmers were more challenged by the second consecutive year of record cool temps in May and June. So what's causing the warm temperatures this month? USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says it's actually something that started in mid-June. We started to see some trouble brewing in Texas more recently that's expanded into the western United States, especially the desert southwest. That heat that's coming up from the south is likely more related to El Nino than anything we've seen to this point. And Rippey says even though signs of El Nino have been minimal so far, El Nino typically doesn't impact the northern hemisphere until during the cool season. So that October to April time frame, that's when you see the consistent signal with El Nino, usually wet in the southern United States, mild and often dry across the north. All right, thanks, Ty. The Wildlife Center in Phoenix says lines have formed outside the intake window as people come across animals falling victim to the city's record-breaking temperature streak. And farm animals are also suffering in the heat alongside humans. They don't want to eat quite as much, just like, uh, you know, any of us, uh, just not feeling quite as much energy. Is a break from the heat finally on the way this week? Meteorologist Andrew Whitmire has a look ahead. Temperatures this afternoon for this Monday. Notice how that heat has really retracted from the northern plains, the upper Midwest, as well as the Great Lakes region, but it's still relentless uh, down across Phoenix, the four corner states and down across the central and southern plains. We're from Tulsa all the way down towards San Antonio. Going to feel like the triple digit heat mark and even on over into Memphis and New Orleans as well. Going to have to deal with that to higher heat indices for this Monday. And looking at our temperature outlook, we're going to keep that higher heat uh, just off to the south here. And again, we are finally going to see some relief for the northern half here of the lower 48 as we welcome in August. Looking at the jet stream for this Monday, we're going to have to watch for a few ridge riders here as we go throughout today, and that's going to spark some scattered showers and thunderstorms for parts of of the Plain States and check out this grasshopper invasion in Saskatchewan. Mike of Max Ag Consulting sharing this video saying it's breathing through your nose and not your mouth season. Cereal crops in the region have it tough this year between the heat and the dry conditions and now grasshoppers. Some are hoping to salvage what they can for livestock feed. I'll have more on your Ag Day forecast in just a few. All right, thanks, Andrew. Lots of people sharing this video online. It appears to show a crop dusting plane flying very low, nearly clipping a semi truck. Nothing was hit. No one was injured. The video was taken last week while Clifton Howard says he was driving on US 30 in northern Indiana. Now, Howard told local media he had never seen a crop duster flying this low before. The pilot of the plane has not been identified just yet. It's reported the FAA is aware of what happened and is investigating. While some people choose not to eat red meat, a growing number of people simply can't eat it without getting sick. New numbers from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show thousands more Americans are testing positive for alpha-gal syndrome. It's a condition spread by tick bites that cause allergic reactions to eating red meat. In fact, the agency just announced up to 450,000 people in the U.S. may have been affected by this issue since 2010. It's a big increase from the handful of people in Virginia when it was first reported back in 2008. It's now reported most cases are in southern and eastern states known to harbor the Lone Star tick, which you can see here in blue. The tick saliva is linked to the allergy. Reactions can be mild, things like rashes and nausea, right up to life-threatening anaphylaxis. Now, experts say you can help protect yourself by using insect repellents and avoiding heavily wooded or bushy areas. 
More export sales of soybeans weren't enough to push markets higher on Friday. We'll discuss that next in analysis. And later, a food tradition steeped in history. Take a look at this year's Ohio State Fair butter sculpture in the country. Despite new crop soybean sales of more than 1.7 million metric tons last week, the market ended Friday in the red. Michelle Rook has more on what to expect this week. Grain markets ending lower on Friday. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing joining us. And John, the pullback in the grains looked like we were just removing weather premium. Very much so. You know, we saw some rain come through the region on Friday. Forecasts carried in through the weekend and, you know, getting some, maybe some possible confirmation there. Just caused prices to kind of continue to slide as maybe the market started moving past those hot, dry temperatures, or those hot forecasts, you know, from earlier last week. So, we we'll just have to continue to watch the weather models as they look a little bit more friendly for moisture and temperatures moving forward. You know, in a window now that we're past pollination and corn and getting to that key uh, flowering and pod filling stage in soybeans. Absolutely. How much chart damage did we do, especially getting November beans under that $14 level? Yeah, Friday's closes were pretty tough and actually started a little bit on Thursday. Beans put in a bearish reversal on Thursday's trade on that November contract. Right. You know, now kind of breaking some of that lower support, taking out some earlier week, earlier in the week lows. Now we're looking at maybe that 1340 area, 1330 area has got some uh, technical support there with some moving average support. I'd say worst case scenario, if things really get aggressive, then we can come back down to the 100 day moving average around $13. On the corn side, you know, here it feels like we could see some pretty good money flow, maybe push this back down and retest that low of 480 again. You know, especially if we got a feeling that this this corn crop's maybe a little more out of the woods. We're still worried about the demand. You know, the funds can move some money back into the short side of this market and, you know, get some downward momentum going, especially with that close this week. Yeah, so if we get these extended forecasts confirmed, you know, is there a lot more downside risk to this corn and bean market, in your opinion? You know, we're going to get past that stage now, too, where even weather starts to move into the back burner a little bit more. We start focusing on the demand side as we maybe get a little better handle on the supply side. USDA report coming up on August 11th, too, so that's going to be something we'll have to watch. Right now, I don't think we'll see a lot of adjustments in terms of the yield and things of that nature, given the July weather. So that just leaves the door open, like I said, for a possible test of that, that 480 area low on that corn contract. You know, we'll see how beans fall, especially now that we've seen a little bit of demand pick up here at these price levels. All right, thanks for joining us. John Heinberg with Total Farm Marketing. That's Markets Now and more Ag Days coming up. To discuss marketing strategies, call 800-334-9779. Registration is open for the 2023 Pro Farmer Crop Tour, August 21st through the 24th. Attend one of our nightly meetings or join online as we gain insight on the 2023 growing season. Visit profarmercroptour.com forward slash register to select the stop nearest you. Looking at the rain chances as we go throughout this week, and we are really being hopeful that, again, we can't see some of this pan out, especially for parts of the uh, Central Plains, especially Nebraska, which really needs the water. I just wish we could get it down into Kansas as well, which needs the moisture, at least for Central and Eastern Kansas, that is. And we'll also see some timely showers at times across parts of the Midwest states, but not a lot going on this week across parts of the Great Lakes region. And this is why we've got the ridge. Again, that heat dome that was expanded across much of the lower 48. Well, that's now backtracking its way further back off towards the south and west. We've got a trough to watch for across the Great Lakes and northeast regions. That'll keep things a little bit near seasonable, near average for this time of year as we go throughout the first a few days of August. And then as we head on into the end of the week here, again, we're going to have to be watching for some family showers and thunderstorms. Uh, we're, we're calling ridge riders here as we go throughout the midweek and the latter half here of this forecast going on into this first full week of August. Then as we wrap up July here on this Monday, again, we'll see some of those greens showing up here, some timely showers and thunderstorms with that to ridge. And then as we head on into August for Tuesday and then right on into Wednesday, again, we're going to be watching for some moisture chances out across the Rockies and again across parts of the northern and central plain states here 
as we wrap up this week. Looking at the precipitation here as we go throughout the first few days of August, August 2nd through August 6th. And again, it keeps that uh, water centered right along the Rockies as well as parts of the Plain States. But again, drying out for parts of the Great Lakes and Midwestern states. Uh, temperatures as we go throughout this first week of August. Again, the heat dome going back to where it was parked to end out July down across the deep south and four corners portions of the US. Checking our temperatures for this afternoon cooler into Chicago, the Midwest Great Lakes area, but that heat that triple digit heat just continues from Tulsa down towards San Antonio over towards Memphis and on over into Phoenix. That's a look around the country. Let's take a look here at Ag Day Select Cities. Wheaton, Kansas, partly cloudy, high temperature nearing 90 degrees, overnight low into the 70s, it's very uncomfortable. Portland, Maine, chance of a few claps of thunder and going over to Nashville, mostly sunny, high 92. Still ahead, Machinery Pete spots a trend in the used tractor market. And later we head to the Ohio State Fair and a tradition that's all about butter. A used tractor for a quarter of a million dollars? Well, one just sold for that amount, and Machinery Pete says he's seeing a trend. Well, folks, my good friends at Trader Real Estate and Auction Company had quite a farm estate auction last Thursday in Jonesville, Michigan. Now, there was a tractor on this sale that opened a lot of eyes. Here's a picture of it. A 2013 John Deere 8285R. This thing only had 492 hours on it, so 10 years old, under 500 hours. It's all for 250000 bucks. So... How's that stack up? Well, it's actually tied for the highest auction price ever on an 8285R. Tied with one sold earlier this year on a March 3rd farm auction in Marion, New York. Here's a picture of that one, which was a 12 model with 1,292 hours on it. Now, a couple interesting things to chew on on 8285Rs here, folks. Uh, the highest auction prices I've ever seen, eight of the 10 highest have all come in the past two years. And if we look backwards in time to when these model, this model first hit the used market, I found an auction that was held March 26th of 2014. Now, of course, 14 used values were starting to fall like a rock, but Sullivan Auctioneers had a sale in Knox City, Missouri, March 26th of 2014, where a 13 model 8285R with only 164 hours on it went for 200,000 bucks. It was one year old. And again, last Thursday in Michigan, 250, so, 25% uh, higher. And one last point, if you look in machinerypeat.com uh, at 8285 hours listed for sale by dealers all over the country right now, you'll find 51 of them and the highest asking price is 229,000. And again, last Thursday in Michigan at auction. All right, thanks Pete, our own living legend. Well, they're honoring some other legends at the Ohio State Fair. And these folks are being honored in butter, 2,000 pounds of it. That story next. It's a tradition dating back to the early 1900s. The butter cow display at the Ohio State Fair continues to be a fan favorite. Well, this year's theme honors innovators and their innovations of Ohio's past. Groundbreaking inventions and innovators from Ohio's past grace the 2023 butter cow display. This year's butter display honors Ohio's rich history of innovation, and we're paying tribute to four inventors who have called Ohio home. Alongside the traditional butter cow and calf, the buttery creations include true to life sculptures of Thomas Edison with a light bulb and a phonograph, Garrett Morgan with a three position traffic signal, Josephine Cochran with a hand powered dishwasher, and James Spangler with a portable vacuum cleaner. The display is made with approximately 2,000 pounds of butter and sculptors spent 360 hours inside a 46 degree cooler to complete the buttery masterpieces. Drawing inspiration from the theme, the sculptors enhanced this year's display with some innovative details. One of the inventions has a glass door on it so you can see into it and see what's going on inside and of course uh, the light bulb which will light up 
and the traffic lights as well. The butter cow display presented by the American Dairy Association Mideast is also a nod to the innovative spirit of Ohio's dairy farmers who are increasingly leveraging technology to make farms more efficient and sustainable. New technologies on dairy farms turn cow manure into valuable resources like soft bedding. Other innovative additions to dairy farms include activity trackers to monitor cow health, robotic feed pushers to ensure easy access to nutrition food and robotic milking systems to milk cows. Dairy farmers rely on science and innovation to continually improve how they care for their cows and care for their land. In Columbus, this is Barb Consiglio reporting. And we want to thank the American Dairy Association Mideast for sharing that story with us. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Griffiths. That's all the time we have. Have a great day. Have a fun country.